let it rip weekend. The Detroit Police Department releasing their crime stats. In 2016, there were fewer non-fatal shootings, carjackings, and robberies. But there were more homicides and rapes than in 2015. Overall, they say crime is down about 7%. I'm encouraged. I'm excited. I'm not waving a flag of success, progress, absolutely. But is it enough progress? And what would make the residents and visitors to Detroit feel safer? Let It Rip Weekend starts right now. It's time to let it rip. I'm Charlie Langton. And I'm Maria Lou. Here with us today is former Detroit Police Chief Ralph Godby, who says Chief Craig is doing a great job with limited resources. Next to him is Negus Vu of New Era Detroit. He says, while it's great that crime is down overall, homicide and rapes have still increased. And those are the crimes that people are actually worried about most. And last is Musin Mohammed, more commonly known as Coach Mohammed in Northwest Detroit. And he says that uh, we need to make more progress. Now, we did invite a Representative from DPD, but they declined our invitation. All right. Mr. Godby, first yes. question to you. Is Detroit safe? We're seeing criminal homicides up 2.3 percent. Well, I think the chief put it the right way. Uh, it's not time to start patting each other on the back yet. I mean, you should take heart in the progress and the trending going down. But when you look at crimes per 100,000, uh, Detroit is still far too dangerous, uh, and particularly in the neighborhoods, downtown, midtown. Uh, tremendous security infrastructure, overlapping security cameras. Uh, you don't have that same infrastructure on Mac and B. Wood, uh, Linwood in Philadelphia. Plus, you had the lack of job opportunities for young people. Um, and then a, a decimated education system over almost 13 years, which is com almost a generation of disinvestment in education. Uh, Detroit still has a long way to go. But are these crime stats, and I guess, let me bring you in here. Do you think these crime stats are actually accurate? Does it really reflect the amount of crime that's going on in the city? I think to a, I think it has to to a certain degree. Um, uh, but what has went down is the uh, actually is the uh, rape that's went down, right? And I'm not the rape. I'm sorry. Yeah, the rape has. It's the robberies that's also went down. And I think. No, I'm, I'm confused. Ro robberies, the robberies went down. Non-fatal shootings down. That, yeah. Homicide rates. So the robberies and carjacking, that's a significant statistics because a lot of times people feel a lot of safe because they always feel like, hey, you go to Detroit, I'm going to get robbed and things of that sort. So that's a good thing to focus on. Now, we're looking at the homicides and then we're looking at the rapes. And as I said, you know, some of those rape statistics is date rapes and things of that sort because one of the things that I used to do a lot was go out and search for rapists. We had a lot of serial rapists two years ago and there hasn't been any serial rapists. So I think that's a big significant uh, achievement in terms of the homicide that's not going to I think that's always going to be a problem um, unless you have more community involvement you have a, a neighborhood watch programs and also we have more development and jobs so it's a lot of it's a lot of um, lurking variables that attribute to when you're talking about homicides Coach, let me bring you into this mix over here. Do you think that there's a, that the chief is saying the progress is being made? How much progress is being made? But what can we do to get a little more progress? Well, progress in this particular situation, and you you, you know, alluded to the question or the statement about do I think that uh, the, the issues are going down? The answer to that is there are measurables, but then there are things that are not measured. The the organizations, the networks. The programs. Uh, currently, there's an outreach program going on, and I'm not sure if people are aware of it, but there's a lot of emphasis put on contacting individuals who are in the 1% who commit the most crimes, and they're given alternatives. And the Who's alternatives. Contacting them? Uh, the, uh, you got the feds, uh, you got local police, because it's a part of ceasefire. Yeah. And a oh, part of that iteration, yes. I wrote the grant, so I know about it. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, so no, I, right. I, I gave, I gave the right. chief the template, oh. and, he, and he ran with it. <laughs> uh, but, but uh, you know, all kidding aside, though, you have a lot of repeat offenders, and reducing recidivism is another issue. Mm -hmm. So with the ceasefire initiative, you have an opportunity to bring the most dangerous of the dangerous in, look at them face to face, and let them know, number one, we're here to help you. But if you step across that line, then there's a, a, another remedy, and it's highly intensive from law enforcement. And not only does that person go down, but their gang affiliations and the other people that they deal with. Profiling to some extent. <laughs> well, it's criminal profiling, and that's an important distinction. Criminal profiling is never illegal, because there is a criminal profile. Racial profiling is completely illegal. Right. So we we have to keep in mind, also, Detroit doesn't have enough cops. Jim Craig can't say that. As the leader, as a chief, uh, I couldn't say it when I was chief. Benny Napoleon would say it for me, and I'll say it for Chief Craig. 
Craig. He doesn't have enough resources. There are not enough cops out there. There's still 140 square miles, and there are much fewer cops than uh, when I came on in 1987. It was 5,000, uh, but it's steadily going down. They probably have under 2,000 cops on the street now, still 140 square miles. And substantively, the part one crime issue has not mitigated at the same rate of population and, drop. And getting back to the details inside mm -hmm. of the program, 30 folks are called in and they're given an ultimatum. You either stop the crime or, and, and they're given alternatives. You got resources, social workers, mm -hmm. jobs. Well, so they are training. planning to hire 200 more officers this year. One, is that mm -hmm. enough? And two, uh, what about the media images? We just ran a story about what it takes to get a single yeah. gun off the street. Is that something that you think attracts officers to this area? Or is it something that makes people say, I don't want any part of it? Well, no, people want to be Detroit police officers. I ran recruiting for three years. So, I mean, there's never a lack of people that want to be Detroit police officers. But the problem is, it takes about six months to go through the training process. When you come out of the training process, then you have a year under observation with a field training officer. So by the time you have a usable officer, it takes a lot of time. So hiring 200, you got to stop the retirements and slow the back end as well. So you're not going to get a net gain of 200 but officers. Let me get this. In that. I'm hmm. curious. You've said before that there's kind of a certain amount of street code going on. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah. So mm -hmm. if you had a thousand more cops, do you think that's going to make it there? Maybe it would make a difference. But but what is it about? What are the cops have to do? What what, what type of person are you looking to be a Detroit police officer to stop this crime? You're in their streets. Everybody. Well, one thing is they have to, they need to be from the community. I mean, flat out, you know. And uh, when we're going back to when we used to have the residency law, we had a lot of officers that you had to be from the community to, in order to police it. Anytime you don't have, and that's from anywhere, anytime you have police officers that's not from the community, unfortunately, you are susceptible to having some level of prejudice. You know, people assuming some things about certain people because uh -huh. they don't understand the culture and they don't, they're not from that community. Cops aren't in Detroit, though. They're not living in Detroit. That's a problem. Well, that's a problem. what do we it's do about it? Problem. Chief, I, I, it's you, a major problem. Can you it's, force it's, them to live in Detroit? Well, no, you can't, but I, I, it's my opinion, and I, I, I spent 26 years in the Detroit Police Department, and all 26 of those years, I lived in the city of Detroit even when I didn't have to. Uh, you, when, you have, when you live in an area, you have a vested interest in who breaks into homes, your neighbors know you, so it contributes to community relations as well. Uh, so it, it really is, and you eroded the tax base when all those yeah, offices sure. and city employees moved out. So, why so they, you're working against yourself. Why are they moving out? Well, they're moving out because um, the, the, uh, they have better homes. They have better homes, quality homes, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, you know, we got to look at the insurance the terrain. Rain. The terrain in, in some of the subdivisions are at the 14, 15 year range, and then you got 30. And, and homes that are older that need a lot of work on them. So there's a there, bit of homes in Detroit. There. Yeah, but you gotta, yeah, but you gotta yeah. look at insurance redlining, education. Redlining, if yeah. I'm sending my kids to school and I've got to pay for them to go to school, I've got to pay more for insurance on a cop salary, mm -hmm. most of the time it's an economic decision. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't want to live in the city, but right. economically they can't afford to. Right. People that have the jobs, like the police officers, are getting out of the city because they have jobs. Yeah. And what does that say about the people living in the city? Do you think there's a prejudice there? I think when I think you have a deprivation, but when you have a vested interest, there's a hard, in a yeah. hard. Uh, there's a situation where you you struggle, mm -hmm. you struggle to maintain and, and get a value for your dollar in your community. Well, think about this: is, you know, over 39 percent of the city, of Detroit, uh, people are below the poverty line, which means that's like 11,000 per household income. Mm -hmm. So there's a, and then you got the insurance, which is high. I mean, anybody say you got people in Detroit trying to get ins addresses outside of Detroit because the insurance is so high, especially when you're talking about cars and everything. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of situations why people don't want to necessarily stay in Detroit because of insurance and things of that sort, but also, of course, they say the crime as well. But, I, but, I don't, but that's got to be true, though. I think there is some merit to that, though. If I know that the crime is, is bad, and I know that if I'm robbed, for example, in the city of Detroit, mm -hmm. I, there's a perception out there that no one's going to rat on the person that did it. I believe people know who did it, but they're not telling the cops. That's the real problem, though, isn't it? That yeah. is a problem. That's not the only it, problem. No, there's there's problem. problem. This is but a... the cops had the same problem, because when cops are engaged in bad activity, they're not telling on each other either. Yeah. So cops got to turn in their criminals before they can put that onus on the public as well. So it's a two-way street. But you, you got to view this as a four-legged animal. But again, one leg, one leg of the element, uh, elephant is 
the cooperation from the citizens, cooperation from the police department, cooperation from the prosecutor's office and the judges. Okay. You know, there's a situation where someone shot at an officer we, recently we, and the guy was out on the street right. the next day. One thing we got to do, and I don't want to sound political, one thing we got to do is make sure that a lot of the development that's happening downtown is hiring and, and creating job opportunities for people of the natives in the city of Detroit. All right, let's hold that thought right there. More to come on this topic. Is Detroit safe? What can you do? Share your thoughts. Go to the hashtag Let It Rip Weekend. And you may very well see your comments on the air at the end of this show. Quick break back in a moment. All right, welcome back, Chief Godby, Negus Blue, and Coach Mohammed here on Let It Rip Weekend. All right, Negus, first question to you. New mm -hmm. Era Detroit, mm -hmm. uh, certainly a group that has a lot of attention right mm -hmm. now, a lot of social media behind you, mm -hmm. a lot of positive things said mm -hmm. about you guys, but some criticism as well. Some people see you guys as militant, mm -hmm. We've seen you on social media, not you in particular, mm -hmm. beating people up, maybe accused of, of committing crimes. Are, mm -hmm. you, are you adding to the problem, or is this the solution? No, we're definitely not adding uh, to it. <laughs> It's a uh, we're a solution because we have a lot of proactive programs. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when you work in 30, 365 days out of the year, some things you do run into that are controversial. But I can say, as a uh, 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 national vice president, that we have a lot, we have a program called Streets is Watching. And it's three shifts a day, and what we do is uh, three hours in each shift, we go in the community and we police particular areas, make sure that the kids get to and from school every day. These are things that we're doing Monday through Friday, and these are type of initiatives that's proactive that we need to really promote in the community. That sounds like a good thing, but well, is that it's, something it's, that the police want, is to have to worry about someone should. else policing people? No, the police yeah. should want that. And you look at Detroit 300, which was an iterative group that started when I was mm -hmm. chief of police, mm -hmm. and uh, I embraced them totally. Now that they have issues where they're hiccups, of course, uh, they're not trained police officers. So sometimes, you know, you have to rein some um, things in. But by the same token, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Hmm. If you have eyes and ears on the street that are willing to get involved, you don't disincentivize a group like that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it, it, do we disagree at times? Absolutely. <coughs> uh, teeth and tongue fall out sometimes, but at a point, you have to embrace uh, that community inertia. Chief, but no disrespect, and I don't want to bring uh, Coach Mohammed. In here, but let me ask you. It seems to me that you guys, I guess, when you're, you guys talk to the people, might be easier <coughs> than if you got someone with a nice suit on. Maybe I mean, is there a relationship there? I mean, we're talking about community policing, mm -hmm. which essentially means that the police have the same dialogue. They speak the same language mm -hmm. as the people on the streets. Mm -hmm. You guys seem to do that. That's what you guys kind of. That's kind of what you do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious as to why maybe you can do it, and maybe others like the police perhaps can't. Well, let me just say this. Quality communication, 90 percent. 90 percent of quality communication is listening to people and doing proactive things. And the Grandma Patrol, I'm the president of Grandma Patrol, and we spend a lot of quality time <laughs> observing and reporting before the crime takes place. And then you initiate the, the support units, the social workers, the resources, the other things to help deter crime. One example, Harold Rochon, I will call his name, he brought a certain number of officers to my neighborhood when he was chief of police and sat the, the gang members down and counseled them. The next day they came out with a brand new lawnmower. I don't know where they got it from. Oh, wow. They cut the grass, they cleaned the windows, they cleaned the house, and the crime went away. And, and don't let the suit fool you. I can take a Hugo Boss off and I go on the street. Mm -hmm. And I made my <laughs> reputation going on the street right. yeah. and dealing with the community. Yeah. It's not what you wear, it's the level of engagement that you have. And Chief Craig, I have to give him credit. Uh, he is a very community-oriented chief of police. Um, so, you know, that, that level of communication, it is, it is strong, it's iterative, and perception of crime is an issue as well. And the perception is changing as well. Chief Craig has a lot to do with that. And you know, a lot of people want to call him Hollywood and things like that. But you have to use this medium to your advantage to take away the fear of crime as well. So a lot of it is very real. But by the same token, uh, Chicago has issues, New York has issues, Cleveland, Miami. But their media don't portray it always in the same manner that ours has in the past. So it seems like we're getting a better shake with the media I mean, lately. Chief Craig is doing a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. And I think the police officers that I've seen on the streets, they do engage in the public. They they 
they absolutely. really, really do. And as we showed it in your story, mm -hmm. such a tough job these officers have. Where's your take on this? I think um, I'm in between. I think uh, Chief Craig and the police have done made some good strides, um, especially when, like I said again, the robberies. That's huge. That's huge. It went down significantly. And uh, again, these homicides. That's not something that the police can totally take care of. That has to be something. That's that's a that's like I said. It's a lot of variables that's attributing to that. We're talking about education, culture. We're talking about culture. Yeah. You know, even when we had the street code um, that we're still promoting, where you know people are robbing people and then killing them. You know, all these things because a lot of the homicides are just direct relationships. When you have these miscellaneous killings, that also raises the bar up even higher where it could have been. Hey, Charlie, if I said this very quickly, and this should be noted, you all did a piece earlier with uh, uh, Action Jackson mm -hmm. and, and right. Streak out on the street. Yeah. They took in some very, very dangerous people, and they were protecting the perpetrator from a dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that speaks to the culture that's been created. You can police well and police constitutionally, and you can mitigate the risk of hurting those that you take into custody. Do, do so Detroit Police Department should get a huge pat on the back. Only if there's a stat, stat we have over here, only about 51% of the crimes, though, are uh, prosecuted. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I'm curious as to why, how can we up that number? Because it seemed, it seemed to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, that if, we, if, if 100%, say, of the crimes are Re reported and then arrested, that might decrease the number of crime. Anybody? Uh, well, it's resource uh, allocation. Uh, you know, we've got to work to get Madam Prosecutor the resources. I'm sure she would take on a higher caseload, but when you have fewer prosecutors, then you have the the backlog with the rape kits. She has so many things on her plate that goes directly to resources, and uh, County Executive Evans has done a tremendous job uh, uh, getting around the consent decree and coming out of that to get the county financially set, but it needs money. They, but she can't needs money. we even really believe these numbers? We see it with TV ratings. There's a way to <laughs> flip it and make make it look like crime is down because you're only counting this group, mm. or it's women with cats under 50. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, so uh, when you look at the the part one crime statistics, mm -hmm. uh, they're in, in in batches. So you do have to do a deeper drill down, which is what the chief and his staff did. But one thing you can't manipulate is a body count. Homicides are homicides. Mm -hmm. 306 is 306. So mm -hmm. you can't get around that. Mm -hmm. And those are the numbers I think. Uh, where the rubber meets the road, where Coach, Detroit is uh, looking for some uh, relief. I, I understand finances, I understand the money, but one of the issues we need to have is we need to have community liaisons that support the, cr the victims because a lot of the issues fall through the cracks when the victims try to move forward in getting results. Do you think there are people out there that know who did the crime but are not telling the cops? I think they need help. I think they need help. The people that know? The people that know. What are they afraid help. of? Or well, retaliation. I mean, you you, you, yeah. that's a very real reality. So how do you undo retaliation? With. Well, uh, by prosecutions, number one, and swift, you know, identification, prosecution. But that goes to resource allocation you as well. Well, well you, you have that, and then you just have the culture of not snitching. You know, let's, let's be real about it. You know, sometimes a lot of people are scared to snitch and be known as a snitch unless, you know, they're on the line. They don't mind snitching then. So you got that aspect as well. It's a lot of things. They don't want to be on television sometimes when we interview yeah. the witnesses because, oh, no, they'll come after me. I mm -hmm. checked my phone uh, from December and I had 1,500 calls. Now, that's me as a personal individual. Can you imagine if the uh, police department had 15,000 or 20,000 calls mm -hmm. from 911? And, you know, you have to be able to prioritize prioritize the information so it's a smoother system. Networking, meetings, DPD, community meetings, and things of that sort. And one eight hundred narrow up. down and, and take some of those police officers from downtown. Take just use a little some of them downtown. Bring them up to the you know the hood for a high minute. <laughs> That's all. That's another thing that might help too. I think yeah. so. I think so. Mm -hmm. All right. Coming all right. up next, we want to share your thoughts live on the air. Don't forget use the hashtag. Let it rip. We might read your comments live. We'll be right right back. All right, welcome back. Now it's time for you to be a part of the discussion. Chief's first question to you. Um, the Republicrat <laughs> says, uh, it looks like to me homicide is just taking over plain old crime. In other words, yeah, everything else is down, but homicides is what everyone really cares about. Unfortunately, that is the metric that most major cities are looked at. And uh, to the Republicrat, mm -hmm. uh, I think he, he or she is very astute at, at that observation. 
Uh, however, uh, if you look at homicide as a percentage of part one crimes, you figure there are probably 80 to 85,000 part one crimes that go on in a major city. So 300 out of 80,000, uh, one homicide is too much, but still in relative terms, it's a small percentage of part one crimes. Looking at the numbers, uh, when you were chief versus Chief Craig, is he doing a better job than you? Well, he's, doing, he's building on uh, the successes that we started. Uh, I had the largest decrease uh, since 1967. I think at 308 homicides, 310, uh, he surpassed that uh, going under 300. It's not a competition. Uh, it is building upon uh, the success of the past. All right, let me go over here. Frank Scott writes here, our prisons must be full of people from Detroit who are murdering all of these people. Do you think putting people in prison, that's the way to, to do it? And if it is, how do we do it? The answer yeah, is ahead, no. Judge. No. That putting people in prison doesn't fix the problem. It puts a Band-Aid on it. You know, we need more proactive uh, involvement in our city, especially as it relates to our, you, our youth, especially the youth. Negus, this question to you from Frank Scott. The cops are afraid of the thugs. Do you believe that there's an issue with officers going into the city and having those real conversations that New Era has? Ralph, are you afraid of uh, people? Not at all. Never you, have. And that's because he's from Never the community. Have. So a lot of times, again, when we're dealing with um, people that live outside the community, they have formed these prejudices, being prejudiced towards particular people based upon just uh, fact and uh, ignorance. Because I can have a do rag on, I can have a scully, and I can have a master's degree. Absolutely. But if you're not from this community, you may feel as though that's a thug. Coach, is that something you agree with? Do you think police are afraid to go into some of those communities? Yes, I agree. When you're familiar with the terrain, you're not as threatened. But but make no mistake about it, there is a risk in certain areas by certain people. Well, that's the nature of police. That's the nature of police. Sure. Let's get another question over here. John wants to know about young people. Do they think that young people have the respect for law that maybe older people do? Well, uh, it's a two-way street. Uh, I found nine times out of ten, when you give respect, you get respect back. So the kid with the do rag, his pants hanging down, I don't presume that he's a thug, uh, which I, I detest that term because that's like the modern day N word. Uh, but what I look at is a young person <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is being trendy, and he's sir or she's ma'am right. until they prove otherwise. I think that's it. You give them respect, and they'll give you respect back. A lot of times, too, too many times, I hear from kids that the elders automatically just write them off, and they mm -hmm. just assume something about their character, or they try to tell them something about themselves without even having an, an actual conversation. dialogue, yeah. conversation. All right, this is going to be it. We have to cut it right off there. Thank you so much. That is it for this edition of Letter of Weekend. Remember, head over to fox2detroit.com for all of the news of the day. Happy Sunday, everyone.